Welcome to Shovel Talk, a podcast for economic developers. From your friends at the Golden Shovel Agency. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Shovel Talk. I am your host, Darren Varley. Um, if you are a Golden Shovel client, you have probably noticed in uh, Q1 of 2024 that we have put a lot of effort towards um, focusing on the childcare issue uh, throughout America um, with our educational content. Um, and this podcast is going to focus on that. So we have Rachel Krakemeyer, um, Executive Director at Engage Group in Nebraska, on the pod this month, talking about some of the, the successes she and her group have had uh, addressing this issue in their community and county. So Bethany Quinn was lucky enough to get her on a pod, and I'm going to pass it off to her to have the interview with Rachel Krakemeyer, Executive Director at Engage. Take it away, Bethany. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Shovel Talk. I am Bethany Quinn, Executive Vice President with Golden Shovel Agency, and I am joined here today by Rachel Krakemeyer, who is the Executive Director of Engage. Engage has been a client of ours for Gosh, I feel like it's almost a decade, Rachel. It's been a really long time, and I've so enjoyed witnessing the growth of your community. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for, for asking us to join you today. Of course. So I wanted to introduce you, obviously, to our listeners. And one of the things that people are always wondering is why economic development, right? Like nobody is five years old and says, I'm going to be an economic developer when I grow up. No one has any idea what it even is. So what drew you to this industry? To be quite honest, it was kind of something that was just thrust into my lap and said, hey, here's an opportunity. Have you ever thought about it? I was like, okay, first of all, you got to tell me what the heck I'm going to be doing because I think I have an idea, but I'm not really sure. So kind of going through with the existing board and kind of talking about what all an economic developer does, it really kind of dawned on me is it's a person that likes talking to people. And that's something that I've just kind of naturally done throughout my whole career. Um, I've just kind of figured it out as I went along. I went to college and then just kind of got into a job and one led to the next. And now I'm here and I absolutely love what I do. And I get to talk to different people every day from all over the world, which is super fun and exciting. Yeah, that's actually a really cool thing about uh, Gage County and, and your area that not everyone knows that you have global companies based yeah. in Gage County. I thought that was actually so cool. You know, you're a rural community. So that's not something that immediately comes to mind. Yeah, I mean, our county alone has right around 22,000 residents and and Beatrice being the the county seat has about 12,500 of those. So it has about half of the county's population just centrally located. Um and and to have not just one but several international companies is is really astounding for our, our area. Yeah, absolutely. And from all over the world. I know you have companies from various Asian countries, European countries, and from Canada as well. So very cool. And, you know, it's interesting because we are talking about workforce quite a bit. Obviously, all those companies, whether they're homegrown or they're setting up shop in the U.S. from another country, need to have a strong workforce. And, you know, I think it's really interesting that your journey to economic development actually took you through that workforce lens, right? You were with uh, Southeast Community College for quite a while, right? Yes, I was with them for about four years, kind of dove into the higher education. Again, very people oriented in that role um, or two roles I was in. And then prior to that, actually did Department of Labor work. So employment and training. So it's always been workforce development for me. And I always like to ask how that influences your work as an economic developer, having that background. Um, you know, I'm I'm really passionate about um, when it comes to workforce development, connecting youth to employment opportunities. And a lot of this came through my own upbringing and and how I was raised and things I was taught is. If you don't know what you want to do, look at all of the opportunities that you have to be able to figure those things out, whether it's job shadowing, internships, work experience, things like that. I worked at a very young age and had several different jobs. I was that kid as you know, a 10 year old that had a paper route with my brothers back when the paper was delivered home to home kind of thing. And so I think that really inspired me. I mean, I was pushed and pushed and told, and we, it was ingrained in us that to be successful in life, you had to have a degree. You had to get a bachelor's degree, hands down. So being the first in my family to go to college and graduate with a degree was something that I absolutely 
was going to do. I was dead set to do it, did it. And then it was like, okay, well now what? Now I have the piece of paper, what am I gonna do with it? And I think that's what a lot of our youth are facing today is I don't really know what I wanna do. And I don't have to spend a lot of money trying to figure it out. There's lots of other opportunities. And so we're, I'm really taking that approach of working with our local industry and area employers of saying, we know that you don't require your employees to have a bachelor's degree. Why are we telling them they need to get one? Let's look at all of the other opportunities that they have out there readily available. And let's show them what jobs are tied to that in the end. And so kind of taking that backwards approach and, and really getting employers on board and connecting them with our area youth. Um, you know, we do lots of industry tour days and things like that just to show kids what we have here because they don't know. Right. Yeah, so, yeah. It's interesting because kids are not always going to actively go look, right? If you don't approach them and give them that information very easily they're probably never going to know what's in your community. So I'm sure your employers actually really appreciate that you're taking the time to make those connections and introductions. Yeah, they do. They love it. Anytime they say, give me a call, Rachel, we'll give anybody a tour. <laughs> yeah, it's nice. That's all it takes, right? That exposure. Yep. So the other side of the workforce equation that we're spending a lot of time talking about right now, and you guys are doing a great job in, is addressing the childcare shortage. Because even if you want to work, if you have a kid who is not yet in school, if you don't have care for that child, it's going to be really hard for you in order to find your way into the workforce. And obviously, we've seen post-COVID, there's been so many people drop out of the childcare workforce as well, right? That the spots we had before are even more, uh, more taxed. So one of the things that I know Engage has done is work with First Five Nebraska to start with the gathering of that data to really figure out what your needs are. And I would really love for you to chat about what caused you to initiate that process, how it went, and maybe the benefits of just starting at that point, right? The, the data gathering stage. Why did you decide to start there? When you think about how childcare impacts a community, the, the, biggest, the biggest driver is, is getting the people to understand the root of the issue. And it's not the people that are in the thick of it. The people that are in the thick of it are the parents, the parents that are struggling to find it. And, and sometimes their employers, oftentimes their employers aren't even aware because the employees aren't sharing that information with their employers. When people leave jobs or step down, if they step down from a full-time job to a part-time job, often they'll say it's because of lack of Child care. Maybe, maybe it's because they don't have any and they can only find a relative that can watch them half the time. But when people leave positions, they, they don't typically say why. So we are we are really out talking to our businesses and our employers and saying, are you asking this question? Are your people telling you this? Um, we have lots of employers that say, Oh, our staff, you know, tell us it's not an issue. Well, how did you ask the question? Because oftentimes we're finding that there's a disconnect in, in the real answer um, and, and what the question is actually trying to derive. So we knew, we knew quite frankly that that our community, our county, our businesses would really need data to understand the complexity of this issue and how it really impacts our community growth as a whole. From my perspective, Childcare is is one leg of a three-legged stool in a community where that whole stool is your community. You have jobs, you have childcare, and you have housing. If you don't have those things, you don't have a community. And we're living in a world right now where people are choosing first where they want to live over the job that they work in. So the community has to have those amenities and those basic necessities like housing and childcare for a family to thrive. So we knew that we needed that data in order to really prove to our community that there is an issue. Not only did we work with First Five Nebraska, but we worked um, with Nebraska Children and Families Foundation who had provided um, through several different funding sources through the federal government and, and the state through the Department of Health and Human Services, um, grant opportunities to help bring this issue out into the public light and, and to also help us garner the, the data that we needed to really start to solve the problem here at our local level. 
one of the amazing things about the funding is the state recognized that this isn't a one size fits all. This has to go down to the local level and communities have to figure out what suits them best and what solutions they need to implement to really solve it in their area. Because what works for us may not work for, you know, Scotts Bluff or North Platte or even a smaller community like Broken Bow or Albion or, you know, those types of communities. For Beatrice, you know, we're, we're, when I started, we're working from a deficit of, of quality childcare spots of nearly 400. Um, that has an impact of six to seven million dollars annually in in the form of of retail sales taxes and all of those types of things that's including losses to businesses um, that they're experiencing because of loss of production because their employees aren't showing up or they are just lacking employees in general so lots of data um, we were able to bring that out into into the public and and really get some traction on this initiative moving forward so one of the things that you just said is so powerful, right? You were able to articulate that the lack of child care space is creating a six to seven million dollar annual economic loss. And mm -hmm. I think that the ability to have that conversation is so important when you're trying to secure investment and support from your stakeholders. So I liken it to the same conversations you would have if you were trying to prepare a site for development, right? Like maybe you're trying to bring yep. in a business and you want a business to come in that might have a $6 million economic impact, but guess what? You have that opportunity to grow your economy already under your nose if you can just provide people with childcare. So that is incredibly powerful. One thing I, I will say, because I think it's also impactful too, that a lot of people still think that economic development is just simple business recruitment, that we recruit in big industry, big manufacturers, things like that. It's it's not. I, I would say 80 to 90% of what I do on a daily basis is supporting the businesses that we already have here um, and focusing on the supports that they need. What, and that's childcare, that's housing, that's all of those additional things that impact them and their bottom line, which ultimately impacts our bottom line and and th that tax basis, right? Um, everybody, everything attributes to taxes. If we can lower that tax uh, basis on current residents by bringing in additional investment or helping our existing businesses grow and thrive, that's going to tip and balance those scales back in our favor. Yeah, absolutely. And having the data to direct those conversations is fantastic. As is identifying how many spots you actually need, right? Uh, you said there's a problem and not everyone was aware. But now when yeah. you come back and say, well, we're 400 spots short, you know, that's pretty significant. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to talk about some of the cool things you're doing to help solve it. This is yeah. at the very entry level, but you have a babysitting clinic. How cool is that? Tell me more. Yeah. Um, so this is something actually that uh, Beatrice Community Hospital and Health Center, along with um, the University Extension Office, kind of had partnered together and offered this in the summer. And through this initiative, we were able to help step in because childcare is a business, right? They provide a service to families to provide care for their children. And, and so we're really working to help childcare providers understand that they're business owners, they're entrepreneurs, they're things like that. So kind of connecting those, those workforce development dots as well. Uh, but we saw an opportunity to use some of the funding that we had received through Nebraska Children and Families Foundation to really um, help and aid in a, in a really small way, but an impactful way. You know, I myself have a daughter that's that's becoming of age to start babysitting. And, and I thought, you know, if we can take it from last year, they had 20 enrollees because that's what that's what the budget could afford to train. And we can ramp it up to 60 or 100 spots available for students to come in and learn how to be a babysitter. This is this is great for everyone. And let's open it up to the whole county. So that's what we did. And I think we we were close to about 50 participants um, with that training. So it it went great. Um, we we're very excited and, and hope to continue to grow that event in the future. Well, I think that's fantastic. And again, that's a very innovative approach. We know that sometimes people miss work for things like 
a child being sick or their current care provider being unable to watch a child by being on vacation, for example. So babysitters can step in to fill that gap. Also, of course, you you said you have a daughter. Uh, my husband and I have seven kids and I know it's scary hiring a babysitter, right? You don't mm -hmm. know if this person is going to know how to care for a child, not poison them, what to do if they're choking, make sure they don't get run over, you know, the basics, right? Keep them alive. Mm -hmm. So making sure that they have that ability to get training is, is probably really fantastic for all the families in your community. Absolutely. And I think it takes a little bit of pressure off the parents too. Yeah, for sure. No, I love that. And, you know, another thing that's so important about what you said is, is of course, understanding that childcare is a business. And our home-based daycares are filling the needs in communities across the country, right? Even though they may only mm -hmm. be able to care for five, six kids at a time, that really adds up. So with your babysitting clinic, have you heard of anyone that's interested in maybe making a career out of this and starting an actual business after they're graduated from high school? Yeah, I recall there was a, a few that have. Now, I will say, um, taking that a step further and, and pulling it outside of the babysitting clinic, just promoting the initiative in itself has really opened the gates. Further partnering with the Beatrice Community Hospital, they have five billboards um, that are at every entrance into the city of Beatrice. And they partnered with us and allowed us to use those to promote the initiative and show the lack of of child care spots in Gage County. Um, from that billboard alone, I've received numerous calls and inquiries about I'm I want to become an in-home child care provider or I want to start a center-based program. What resources do you have? How can you help me? What role do you play? Those types of things. And so I'm able to do what I do best and I'm a connector of people and resources. And so I can get these people set up and, and point them in the direction of all of those things that they need. So the babysitting clinic, I think is is you know, building those, those thoughts and motivations and, and maybe laying out the next steps for, you know, maybe a, a 12 to 16 year old uh, individual to think maybe this is what I want to do for the rest of my life or after I graduate. But the initiative as a whole is really showing people, hey, I can do this. And there are supports out there um, that weren't there before because childcare was just something that you know, a lot of women did, so they could stay at home. And now people are choosing that as their career, which is amazing. Um, what these people do on a daily basis, you know, we all love our kids. Absolutely. There's a lot of us that love to go to work every day and have that, that alternative sense of purpose and then go home and be the mom. Um, but there's people that want to care for other people's kids on a daily basis. And thank God for those people. Uh, we love them dearly. We have so many um, additional members of our family because of those individuals that we will have for life um, because of that. So I think that's fantastic to point out that simply the awareness that you created through the initiative inspired more people to start their business or go into childcare. I think that's something that's so obvious, but we don't necessarily do a good job of, right? Is just engaging mm -hmm regular residents, regular folks, and helping us to solve the problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And that's something that we're, we know it's, it's hard to recruit people to come to you and live in your community, right? So we have to focus on what we have here available. And this initiative, a lot of the things that we are doing are great, but it doesn't come without its struggles, right? It's, it's, it's two steps forward, one step back. A lot of the child care providers um, that we see right now are at or nearing retirement. We know that we still have a long battle to fight, um, that for every every spot we add in available capacity, one retirement could wipe that and then some. Sure. Uh, you know, just over, over the last annual year, I just developed our Engage 2023 annual report, and we had a net positive in capacity expansion of one spot. Because we added 43 spots, but we lost 42. Oh, wow. So, it, you know, it's it's two steps forward, one step back. But we could be negative 80 sure. in that respect. So, you know, it's, it's one of those that we're just going to keep chipping away. 
um, you know, the year before we added 64 spots with no reduction. So we're, we're still very positive. We've reduced our overall deficit since I started um, in this role and working on this initiative by 24%. So we're very proud of that. We're about a quarter of the way in. We've got a lot of work to do um, and, and some exciting things happening in the future yet that we can't wait to share with the public on what that is. But um, yeah, challenging, but exciting all in the same. And I did want to ask you about some of the incentives and grants that you've been offering that have helped you to make that impact. I know that you've had some incentives to help with licensure, some to help with expanding capacity. Could you talk a little bit more about that? So um, as it started, um, there's been several grants that we have been able to secure through the Nebraska Children and Families Foundation. We have assisted with or brought in um, a grant amount of nearly... $750,000 into Gage County through, through a wide variety of grants. Some of those we've been a direct assist to local providers um, going after some of their own grants, as well as grants that we solely through Engage have fiscally sponsored and then pushed out to child care providers throughout the county. But yeah, some of them are, are aimed at um, assistance with licensing, training requirements, capacity expansion efforts, retention efforts, um, all of the same. A lot of what we've been doing through our fiscal sponsorship as well is, is looking to create that sustainable vehicle moving forward. So what I've been working on recently, it's it's not super public. So this is, this is a great way to kind of start to showcase and highlight our work in this is we are creating a, an independent nonprofit uh, 501c3 entity that will be able to be the, the sustainable vehicle moving forward that will have more experts tied to the early childhood and education realm that know a heck of a lot more about those things than I do, but they'll have a seat at, at the table. I'm creating a board of directors to run this nonprofit um, with lots of well, uh, extremely knowledgeable um, individuals in these various areas, including child care providers themselves, because who better to have on a board to, to figure out how to solve the issues in, in child care than child care providers themselves. So, you know, we're looking for an in-home provider as well as a center-based provider um, and even teachers to be able to have a seat at that table to talk about really what are what are the right things to do and the right solutions for us to provide that early childhood care as they grow into the public school system? What does that look like? We're in the process of, of developing that right now. We are securing the, the nonprofit name of Gage County Child Care Collaborative because, again, we're a countywide initiative. So this effort isn't being focused just right here in Beatrice, but the county as a whole. And, and that vehicle, that nonprofit will then also could have the potential to own property. Um, we could also do um, some campaign feasibility studies to do a big capital campaign to build our own center if we wanted. Really the possibilities become endless. It can also simply just be the vehicle to continue to provide additional grant funding to area providers or just support and access to resources to area providers moving forward. Yeah, innovative as always, right? That's fantastic. That's not <laughs> something that most communities are doing, but what a great idea. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's something, um, that we, something we've learned, I guess, in, in this initiative is there's, there's lots of conferences and lots of resources that a lot of people have no idea about. We would have had no idea about if it wasn't for a lot of the grant funding that we've received and pushed out to the local area. Going to those conferences, like the Thriving Children's Conference in Kearney, it's usually in September, they showcase communities and communities come and they talk about, here's the issue we have, here's what we did to solve it, Here, here's kind of best practice or tips and tricks that, you know, we learned after the fact. And so what I've done over the last two years really is, is take bits and pieces from every community that I got to see and hear and talk to and figured out how I was going to mix those together or push those together to 
put in place the solution that would work for us. So a lot of the things that I've done or Engage has done in the local area has really just been kind of bits and pieces plucked throughout the state and even things happening outside of the state that are really being impactful for us. So thank you to those communities that that have trailblazed many years ahead of where we are. Uh, we wouldn't be where we are today had they not done it without any of the supports provided. And that's why we wanted to have you here, right? So we could encourage the next group of yes. people to learn how to tackle this problem in their community. So yep. I appreciate you being willing to share what you're working on, even uh, the newest initiatives, right, that are not quite at press time yet. So yeah, I'm sure everyone listening appreciates that that insight and those tips. So thank you. Absolutely. Now, Rachel, I know you've listened to this podcast, so you know at the end, there is always a bit of a game. Well, I love games. Game? <laughs> I'm ready. Okay. So we have... 60 seconds, which is not a lot of time for you to answer as many questions as possible. So I'm going to get my phone stopwatch, right? To see if we can get our 60 seconds in. Minute to win it. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. Go. Favorite song? Uh, Paradise by the Dashboard Lights. Best vacation memory. Oh my gosh. Florida with my kids last summer. Favorite ice cream flavor. Cookies and cream. Childhood nickname. Dorty. Ideal superhero power. Um, I want to be tall. It's not even a superpower. I just, to, I just want to be able to be tall. I could be whatever size I want. Nice. Okay. Uh, your first car. Um, I had a little Pontiac Sunfire. Book you're reading right now. Um, it's called Book Lovers, actually. Number one thing on your bucket list. This probably isn't number one, but it's the first thing that came to mind. I want to go, my husband and I want to go to every single MLB ballpark in the U.S. Oh, fun. Okay, and last but not least, what do you want to be remembered for? My ability to, to just talk to people and be a good friend and a good human and, and really help my community in those those around me. Perfect. Well, good job. You got through them all. Thank you, Rachel. <laughs> Thank you. So I would like for you, if you don't mind, to leave our listeners with some information on how they could reach out to you if they have some questions and want to learn more from you in regards to the work you're doing in childcare. Absolutely. The best way to, to connect with me, uh, it, of course, social media, um, you can check out our Engage Facebook page, LinkedIn page. I'm on LinkedIn. You can find me personally. Um, but also our website has all of my contact information on it. It's engagegroup.org. So N-G-A-G-E group.org. Um, feel free to reach out, give me a call, shoot me an email. I would love to talk to anyone and everyone and help everybody get, get on their path to solving their, their childcare issues. Awesome. Thank you, Rachel. We really appreciate your time today and thank you. Talk to you soon. Thank you, Bethany and Rachel. Again, Q1 of 2024 is a childcare focus here at Golden Shovel. And you can check out all of this great content on the Golden Shovel website under the Resource Learning Center. Okay, Golden Shovel social media accounts, please like us at Shovel Toss. Follow us on Twitter, X, I should say, at Gold Shovel. And follow us on LinkedIn at Golden Shovel. YouTube, please subscribe to our channel, Golden Shovel Agency. And now you can follow us on TikTok at Golden Shovel Agency. We will be back very soon with another episode. And thank you for joining us on this episode of Shovel Talk.